Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. This episode of Changing Higher Ed is sponsored by Perdia Education, a national leader in online student recruitment and enrollment services, providing institutions enrolled students risk-free on a performance-based model with no long-term contract. If your online programs could benefit from incremental online student enrollments, visit perdiaeducation.com. That's P-E-R-D-I-A education.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. In keeping with our theme on risk management, our guest today is Brian Kelly, Director of the Cybersecurity Program at EDUCAUSE. Brian has been an active member of the higher education information security community since 2007, including having participated on the EDUCAUSE Higher Education Information Security Council since 2009. He served on the Awareness and Training Working Group before joining the Security Professionals Conference Committee in 2015. Brian was previously the Chief Information Security Officer at Quinnipiac University, and his career in information security began in the United States Air Force in 1993, where he served as a Cyber Operations Officer. Brian, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Good morning. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. It's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the news with cyber, and that's going to be what we'll talk about today. You know, it's getting more and more publicity and not necessarily in a good way. (laughs) It's crazy. I mean, Rutgers, Michigan State, UC San Francisco, you know, hacked. Ransomware attacks have, have more than doubled over the past year. Even Zoom bombing is is now a thing, or it used to be. So, you know, what's going on? This is crazy. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a crazy world that we live in, right? So I think that, you know, it's hard to be optimistic as a cybersecurity professional. <laughs> and, and what's that old media adage, right? All, all publicity is good publicity. But to your point, there's a lot going on, right? And and it's hard in cyber. I um, I had a colleague who once said, we, we don't talk about the wins, you know, we're not out there in the media talking about the, the, the successes we've had, but you've, you know, you've illustrated a few areas, you know, of the last year or so where it's really helped. I mean, if you want to be positive about it, it's moved the conversation around cybersecurity and information security from sort of just the IT realm up to our presidents, up to our board of trustees, asking sort of the very questions that you're asking, right? So, you know, what is going on? And I think, Maybe that's the good thing now that our chief information security officers and our CIOs are having conversations with their presidents about ransomware, about Zoom bombing and those things. So, you know, trying to be optimistic about it. We're learning um, much through this. We talk about that remote nature, right? We talk about learning. Uh, A lot of learning is happening remotely. A lot of our working is happening remotely. And, you know, Zoom was, that was, you know, really the move. We all shifted to Zoom. And then we had these things called Zoom bombing. And, you know, it's it's great in this in this world, in this technology, we always have to give whatever happens this cool name, right? So it was Zoom bombing. And really what that was, was that we rushed to use a technology and our faculty, our staff, our students weren't fully vetted on how to use it, right? So we got better about securing it and using passwords. And it really helped have a conversation on our campuses with members of our community that prior to COVID, prior to this remote working, may never have engaged with the cybersecurity team or had a need to do that. So that was really the upside of, of that, you know, from a, a teachable moment perspective. Well, there was that upside and there was the other thing that CISOs now have higher job security than they used to, which is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. We used to talk about those resume generating events, right? So those incidents that would, you know, end a, end a CISO's career, you know, I think are, are not that they're not happening, but you, you mentioned a, a number of different incidents, right? And I think those, whether it's SolarWinds, whether it's the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, um, the Acelion third-party vendor sharing, 
all of those have really opened up the conversation beyond just the, the CISO or the Chief Information Security Officer to other aspects of our campus community. So our procurement officers, our business officers, our, our chief financial officers, our presidents, our provosts, having conversations around third-party risk and making sure that we're vetting that, that we're asking the right questions of our partners and our solutions providers before we bring them in into our environment. So that's been another upside to this uh, this change as we've evolved cybersecurity. And and I think you know we we talked a little bit, and I talk a lot actually about the Chief Information Security Office used to be the office of no, N-O. We would tell you, no, you're, you're not doing it securely or no, you're not doing it right or no, you can't do that. And really culturally trying to change that over the last several years to be the office of K-N-O-W. We want you to know how to do that securely. We want to know what you're doing and how we can help you. And I think there's a number of CISOs in higher ed that have really championed that. And I think that's really what helped position cybersecurity teams to be able to support that move to remote teaching and learning through 2020. Universities had to do that type of thing to to be able to instruct with the, with the COVID. So what are some of the things that, that they've learned with, you know, starting off with the Zoom bombing? You know, you talked a little bit about the procurement. So what are some of the things that they've learned? And, and then we'll get into some of the specific threats. Yeah, we've learned, I mean, some of the basic things. So basic in learning how important multi-factor authentication is or MFA, right? So an, another acronym, and that's where you're getting a notification on your phone or a token device so that it's not just a user ID and password. You have another layer of security. And that, I think, is part where when we think about remote, most of our defenses, our posture was built around the assumption that all of our users, our faculty, our staff, and our students, were going to be on campus. They were going to be connected to our campus network. And that provided a layer of security. And now with all of our users being remote, We've learned that we have to protect the user. MFA is a great way to do that. And then sort of another acronym, we talk about endpoint detection and response. So all of those users that are now working from home, working from coffee shops, working from parking lots, they've got you know laptops, smartphones, tablets. We want to make sure that we're able to protect those endpoints wherever they are and not just when they're on our campus network. So those are some of the, the things that we've learned uh, operationally to help be a better posture, better cyber hygiene in this new world we're living in. Well, so many f- institutions now are going to giving students and faculty the ability to work on their telephones. Are telephones a source of problems or threats? Yeah, the smartphone isn't. It's, it's amazing how the smartphone from when the iPhone was introduced, you know, 2007, how quickly that's become. I used to carry a laptop because that's what we needed all the time to do our jobs. I think we can do more on our smartphones. And I think it really becomes, we talk about these zero trust, you know, we're really going to authenticate the user and the device and where they're coming from and paint a full picture of the individuals that are accessing our information versus just sort of trusting the smartphone or trusting that endpoint. So I think the form factor isn't necessarily a risk, but we're always thinking, you know, it's it's not a risk in and of itself, but they are easily lost or stolen. Those are things that really, when we think about a smartphone, especially for our users, we want to encourage them to have a pin, right? Uh, uh, So that their smartphone, if it's someone picks it up, doesn't allow access to institutional data, right? And I think we've we've moved to that where most users now have either a biometric, uh, you know, a face lock or a, a thumbprint or even a simple pin on their phone. And that sometimes it was viewed as a, in a, an obstruction or intrusion, but I think it's become more mainstream now. And I think even our students are, are realizing that their phones have a, a tremendous amount of data that's personal to them, right? So that's always one of the ways we approach it from an, uh, an awareness education standpoint is messaging around what's important to our users in their own lives as much as what's important from an institutional data protection standpoint. Thank you. That's that was a question I had because I have virus protection. I have, you know, other protection on my smartphone and the amount of data that I have on that phone is just amazing. Yeah, I think that's beyond sort of the the risk to the device from malware or viruses. It's really the risk to access the device provides access to your, you know, even if it's just your photos, 
your contacts, some of your location information. So again, it's, you know, sometimes we think of these smartphones. I, there was a great ad recently, and I think it was a, a Radio Shack ad from like the 1990s where it was a full page of technology. And all of that technology was replaced by our smartphone. If, you know, just imagine, you know, everything Radio Shack used to sell, now it's just in one device. Well, you know, they, they talk about the killer app and, you yeah. know, like Lotus 1, 2, 3 was the one that bring the PC or, or Mozilla's, you know, the original Mozilla with, with Mark Andreessen. Yeah. You know, those were what made the internet big and, and the smartphone has changed everything. A- absolutely. And then just like you said, the, kill, the killer app, it's the killer apps. It's, it's something as simple as, you know, being able to browse the web from your smartphone, allowing access to our students to get to their LMSs, their coursework, their email, you know, things that we sort of take for granted that we can have access to on our smartphones. Those of us that have been around long enough to realize those first generations of email on our smartphones was, was not ideal for, for productivity. Well, it was it was better than what we had, though, wasn't it? Right, and and I say and I say this a lot to to students and to my own kids around. The best technology that we're using today is the worst technology that you're going to use in your life. It's just going to continue to get better. It is. So let's get into some of the specific threats. Ransomware. That's a, that's a huge thing right going on right now. Some of the so, some of the stuff that I've read. You know, it's costing institutions nearly 450000 on average. University of Colorado got hacked, and they said, no, we're not paying the $17 million ransom. And now students' data is showing up on the dark web. Yeah, so the, the threat ransomware has been around for a while now, right? And as we see different threats in vectors evolve, you're sort of seeing that evolution in the tactics that the, the adversaries are using. So you're right, the... The threat of ransomware continues to grow. There's probably an overlay if we look at the growth of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency over the last few years. So that was one thing that facilitated ransomware. You could monetize ransomware in a way that you couldn't previously. You know, it was maybe you had to pay with a credit card and there was ways to manage that from a risk perspective. So cryptocurrency allowed it to move forward. We also saw the adoption of cyber liability insurance, which would then pay ransomware as part of the policy. So a few years ago, institutions were making decisions around whether they had the capacity to pay or not, where now the the ransomware actors, when they see that an institution has cyber liability insurance, they almost feel like that's a guaranteed payday. So we see a little bit of that fueling it. Your numbers, I think, you know, we talk about the ransomware, right? Just what the number, the dollar amount that the ransomware hackers are asking for, but also the lost productivity, the impact to our students, the impact to our institution, the impact from a reputational standpoint, those all have costs associated with it. So it goes just beyond the impact of the ransomware itself, but the impact on our institution's ability to operate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that these folks look for is poor security controls. Like, you know, you, you haven't updated your servers on a timely basis. I mean, I my own stuff got hacked a while back, and it was because the updates hadn't been done properly. Right. So some of it is opportunistic. The the hackers are out running utilities that are scanning the, the internet, looking for unpatched systems or systems that haven't been updated. And then when it when it's able to find those, it takes advantage of that. So from a from a defensive standpoint, we're always looking at how do we prevent right? How does cybersecurity prevent and detect the attacks before they're happening, right? So that proactive, sometimes you'll hear the idea of cyber hygiene being being used now as we have to increase our hygiene, meaning that we need to do preventative things, whether that's patching, user awareness, training is still a training. I always say training, but we really mean awareness education, right? When we say training in higher ed, people <laughs> tend to react viscerally, viscerally to that. So we, we want to say, we're educating you on some of the risks and the threats. But I think you're right on is you know, there are ways that we can reduce that attack surface, that we can prevent these attacks, and then also be ready to respond when our prevention fails. Mm-hmm. And that's not only from a IT perspective, but it also has to do from a communication perspective, a board perspective, crisis management, all of those kind of things. Absolutely. And we're seeing our CISOs are being called to the boardroom to answer these questions more frequently now, which is a good thing. They're getting seats at the table, whether that's within the president's cabinet or the leadership team within the president. 
and being more integrated into that enterprise risk management focus and being part of the crisis management team. So we typically have those on our campuses. They typically would focus on some, you know, maybe a natural disaster or an active shooter event, but things like ransomware are really bringing in the, the, the crisis management team and being used in those tabletop exercises to prepare all of those stakeholders for, for when those things happen. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so critical that, that boards and cabinets are prepared for these type of things. And so many of them, it, it's, it's like you said, the more events that happen, it raises people's awareness and the more you can prepare for them. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Right. And I think those questions are great. We want to, we, from the cybersecurity perspective, want our leadership asking those questions. What if this happens? We're seeing this happening in the media. What can we do? Are we doing enough? You know, when we see beyond just the ransomware, I mean, that's the the newsworthy threats that that are sort of, you know, I used to say, don't worry about what's in the news, worry about what's not in the news, right? Because those are the things that are happening behind the scenes. And we do see a lot, when we think about research security, we think about, you know, foreign influence campaigns, larger nation state actors. And we even work with, uh, within Educause, we work a lot with the FBI and our other partner organizations to sort of understand what that threat, that evolving threat landscape is. So while we're preparing for ransomware, we're also thinking about what's also coming down from the threat perspective and what else do we need to be prepared for that we might not have thought about yet or might not have seen enter the higher ed ecosystem in ways that it's uh, impacting other other verticals. Well, given given everything that's been in the news, you bring up an interesting point. The foreign research or the research security, a lot of nation states are going after research that, that's done at the universities, FBI involvement with all that. What's what's going on with this? So one of the major shifts we're seeing around research security is this, uh, again, another acronym, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or CMMC, that is part of the Department of Defense's standard now for any institution that is doing Department of Defense research on their campuses. So while that standard is is across the, the DIB, the defense industrial base, and is impacting most of our uh, defense contractors currently, it is going to apply to higher ed research institutions. And we're also looking at that because the foundation of the CMMC standard is a NIST publication 800-171 that was published about five years ago on how to protect controlled but unclassified information or, or CUI. I, 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 can't, I can't speak without, without these acronyms. Yeah. And just the acronym NIST, for, for those of us who don't know what it is? Is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Sorry. Okay. Yep. No no worries. You know, us neophytes. It, it is so hard. And I think this is, you know, back to sort of the challenge of speaking to the boards and being asked. One of the things that we're working on is a board primer. So we can take the geek speak that the CISOs and, and the IT folks <laughs> Use, take, you know, use every day and make sure that it resonates with our leadership and is understandable. And I think um, when we talk about research, uh, you know, we're doing research not only for the Department of Defense, but many institutions are doing for the National Institute of Health, NIH, and the National Science Foundation. And we, we're going to see more standards, I think, around securing that research because when we talk about foreign influence campaigns, some of that goes back to espionage and it's not necessarily hacking. Some of it could be human intelligence where uh, faculty are, are placed in a, in a role in order to get them access to information. So that's where there's sort of that overlap. You talked a little bit about sort of the crisis management, some of our federal rela relations folks on our campuses. It really is a holistic approach when we think about uh, securing our research and our intellectual property on our campuses. Most definitely. That's a huge piece of it right now, especially with everything going on. We're, we're seeing more and more. And of course, this has been going on in the defense industrial base for, for many, many years. You see Chinese aircraft fighters, you know, with nearly the same design as some of our top line fighters. Like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder how they got that. Well, it's no surprise. Right. And I think, you know, for you know, we for our campus, for our researchers that are on our campuses, nothing is more important to them than their life's work of research. So I think it really appeals when we 
go back to that mantra of we're here to help you, right? The cybersecurity team wants you to know how to secure your research data, to how to do this securely, and to be viewed as a partner with our with our researchers, with our leadership has really been a game changer for us in the last couple of years. And, and really, we're all in this together. Yeah. And this is not the not one of those lies like we're from the government. We're here to help. <laughs> right. No, and it's, it's it's always that you always hear that from the auditors, right? The government or the auditors. We're here to help you. I think that's the important takeaway is that you on every campus, there is someone that is is concerned around information security and cybersecurity. If you you don't know who that is, I hopefully uh, the presidents that are listening, they know that person by name. If they don't, I highly encourage them to reach out and find out, give them a call, ask them what they're doing. Boy, you'll make their day. And also, I think they'll make yours. Absolutely. So the third of those risks that we talked about earlier was that vendor third-party risk management. I mean, the solar winds is huge. They, I don't think they even know what the, the full implications of that are. Excelion, you know, another one. Yeah, I think, you know, it's really important to have an inventory of the third parties that you do you do business with as an institution, right? So that goes back to the, the our business officers, our procurement teams, our contracting officers on campus, that we have a really robust understanding of, of who we're working with and what data we're sharing with them, what institutional data is being provided to these third parties, and understanding contractually of how that third party will use that data. Yeah, so SolarWinds, it's maybe a good example of a bad example, right? So SolarWinds was the brunt of a full nation state attack, right? They're, so they're what we call a supply chain attack. So that's a little bit beyond just sort of a third party, right? So there's third party risk that we want our, our presidents and our leadership to be aware of. And then there's this supply chain, which has really moved into the conversation, these supply chain attacks, where the nation state that went after SolarWinds, SolarWinds wasn't what they wanted to attack. They wanted to get access to the customers that use SolarWinds. And SolarWinds, without getting really techy, is a network monitoring and management software that is on 18,000 companies, I think was the number, and their networks. So what it allowed was that adversary to have access to those 18,000 customers. So again, important to understand every aspect of what is in your environment. Something like SolarWinds, you, you, maybe your networking team was using that, and folks at the leadership level or the procurement level might not have understood the risk, right? So that's part of that. When we think about holistic enterprise risk management strategies, third-party vendors, third-party solution providers, whatever the right terminology that you use at your institution, you have to start with those conversations. Who are we working with? And what, what are the risks that those companies bring to us? Right. And then Acelion was a file transfer protocol used by many higher ed institutions. Right. So again, so uh, uh, and that's where I think early when we started the podcast, we talked about some of the institutions that were, were in that breach. It was widely used. And that's when we think about supply chain in the context of, you know, the, what was the old Willie Sutton? Why do I rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. You know, the same thing applies to these third party. If they, if you can attack a Celion, right, you get by virtue of their customer base access to all of those customers, right? So where we see centers of gravity around vendors being sort of the lead vendor in a space, it makes them an interesting or an attractive target for the adversary. Mm -hmm. And so what can institutions do nowadays to ensure better cybersecurity? So the conversations, right? So we, we always think, what can we do? We, you can always do more, right? So it's raising awareness. Mm -hmm. It's having conversations. It's collaboration, right? So one of the things in my role at Educause is I find that I'm, I'm collecting and connecting the dots uh, across our member institutions. Some days I'm, I'm working like a funnel and I'm listening and bringing in what's, what's working and what the threat space is. And other days I'm sort of amplifying that back out as a megaphone and saying, this is what we need to do. So I think it's really looking at basic things, cyber back to cyber hygiene, collaborating with each other and sharing not only best practices, but sharing what the attacks are, what the threats are, because then we can all learn from each other. Well, there's those, but there's also the nuts and bolts as well as, you know, making sure your IT infrastructure is, is 
updated using VPNs, virtual private networks, those type of things. Oh, absolutely. And we look at, you know, some of the the funding that the institutions are receiving through the CARES Act or the the Higher Ed Relief Act and and seeing if we can get some of those funds to help modernize our IT infrastructure to bring some of those into our security spend so we could maybe do multi-factor authentication and endpoint detection in response. So, you know, those things are important to make sure we're bringing in the technology. But, but I always come back to it's it's not a technology problem. It's largely a people problem. We want to raise awareness about, you know, phishing email. So phishing is where you're getting an email that's asking you to do something crazy or click a link and there's a sense of urgency. That's still a, a very effective attack factor for the adversary. And they know that we all use email. So those things in concert with the technology, I think, help help us be better at preventing, detecting, and responding to these ever never-ending challenges and threats. Yeah. So what do you, I'm kind of curious, what do you think about these password holders? I guess they're a better word for it, like Dashlane or or something like that. Yes. Um, so we call, we call them password managers. Um, some Thank of you. the browsers will do that natively. I highly recommend using a password manager. You mentioned Dashlane, LastPass, one login. There's there's a number of them, just like the browsers we were talking about. Some are Chrome, some are, you know, like fi- some folks like Firefox. You know, we used to, as professionals, advocate, you know, drum, never write down your password. But then we'd ask you to make it harder and longer and more complex. And, you know, even writing down your password isn't as bad as it, you know, just don't put it on a post-it note and put it on your monitor. If you're writing those down and you're keeping those in a locked drawer, you know, that's still better than using weak passwords. But to answer your question, password managers absolutely recommend them. We've got a white paper that we've put out at Educause on it that goes through a few of those top players in that space. Again, your, you know, Google will do it. The, your browsers will do it. Apple will do it by default. And I think we're getting to a maturity level with those password managers. Where in, in some of those instances, we don't even know the passwords. The password manager is pre-filling it and then filling it back in for us. So I think you know, it's 2021 and you and I are still having a conversation around passwords, right? Do we, do we think 10 years ago that we'd be fully biometric by now? Probably, but I think password managers are a, a step in the right direction to sort of take that human risk of using or reusing weak passwords out of the equation a little bit. Yeah. How many institutions do you think have CISOs? So we did our study, our core data services at Educause. The last analysis was done in 2018, and we published that data in an almanac in 2019, which feels longer ago than it actually was. But the number was around 42% at the time, had someone that either had that title of chief information security officer or a named individual that was responsible for cybersecurity. And as we see sort of moving back up to more regulation in that research space, a lot of that regulatory space that that we see coming down the road requires that institutions have someone that's named as a CISO or is responsible. So we we only anticipate that number of folks to continue to grow. I certainly hope so, because, you know, it's not so much the title, as you know, it's the skill set. And you can have someone designated as your CISO or whatever, but unless he or she is going back and getting training and staying up with what's going on, it's useless. You're absolutely right. It's useless from the technology, you know, the, the cybersecurity or technology in general. We're always learning. Every day we're learning. You're never done, right? We're never fully done. The threats are changing. The technology we use are changing. But also having someone with the communication skill, with the trust across the campus, to be engaged and viewed as an enabler and someone that, that is helping is, is huge in that role. So it's not just the technologist that's assigned the security responsibility, but somebody is that's viewed as a trusted partner and really is out, out of their cubicle, out of their office, engaging with faculty, staff, and students is so important and so critical to the role. Because it's the human element that breaks down. And when the human element breaks down, that's when you're vulnerable. Absolutely. So we're getting close to the end of our time. Gosh, I, I think we could talk for, you know, another hour easily. Yeah. Three takeaways for university presidents and boards, please. So we covered a couple of them. One is get to know, if you don't already know your CISO, your chief information security officer, get to know them. Get to get engaged with them if you're not doing that already. 
support what's happening, whether you're talking about modernizing the technology and the infrastructure that's on your campus to be prepared and preventative, and really just sort of engaging with uh, your peers. So at a presidential level, I, I talk about collaboration at the cybersecurity level. We want presidents to talk about cybersecurity with each other. What are they doing and share best practices and concerns at that level? Yeah, really critical. And, you know, one other is presidents, you folks don't need to know this information. You just need to have somebody who does. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a, that's a great bumper sticker, right? You, you don't, you don't need to know. You just need to know who does on your campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just be aware that this stuff is going on on a daily basis. And like you said earlier, Brian, you never hear about the wins. You only hear about the losses. Yeah, it's, it's uh, everybody else on our campus's job is to get us into the media. And the CISO's job is to keep us out of the news. Yes, we do not want to be on the front page in the New York Times. Not for this. So, Brian, what's next for you? What's next for Educause? So, for Educause, we have our annual conference coming up in June of this year. It will be online because we're still in that no face-to-face -face world that we're living in. We see a tremendous amount of interest in privacy within higher ed. So, we're seeing a growth in chief privacy officers, or CPOs, as the acronym would be, around the, the use and collection of our, our student data, things that aren't necessarily regulated, but where we see student success initiatives and student analytics, really making sure that we're being transparent with how we're collecting and using data. So security and privacy have always sort of gone together, sort of like uh, peanut butter and chocolate, but we're really seeing privacy conversations mature on our campuses. So Educause is ready to sort of help that conversation move forward. I will continue. What's next for me is continuing listening and learning because we're always learning and uh, enjoying conversations like this one with, uh, with the community. Well, great. Well, Brian, thanks so much for being on the show. This was really great. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thanks for listening this week. And a special thank you for this week's special guest, Brian Kelly, Director of Cybersecurity at Educause and for his sharing about the current cyber environment and what institutions can do to prevent disruptions such as cyber attacks. I also want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Perdia Education. Visit perdiaeducation.com to learn how they can help you grow your online enrollment through a performance-based model with no risk or long-term contracts to your institution. Our next guest is Dr. Dave Haney, president of Hiram College, who'll be joining us to highlight what Hiram has done in the wake of its academic prioritization and restructuring it began under its previous president, Dr. Lori Varlata, who was a guest on the show about a year ago, and how they've been able to leverage that work to take Hiram to new heights. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.